Influenza A H1N1 virus is a brand new strain of influenza that's not been seen in human populations before. Regular influenza, which circulates every year, um, is it, it, we're used to that. It, it comes and usually in December and ends sometime in March or April. But this is a strain that was picked up literally just last week um, and is a strain that's never been seen in humans. And it's made up of a combination of influenza from swine, from waterfowl, and from humans, all kind of mixed together. And it's the first time it's been seen in a human population. H1N1, there has been person-to-person -person spread as with any influenza. It's still early in the epidemic, and at present what we think is that, as with other influenzas, it's spread by droplets, which means when somebody coughs or sneezes, little particles come out in the air and could land on you if you're within six feet of me, or could land on the surface or a tabletop. If you were to touch that and then touch your face or your mouth or your nose, you could inoculate yourself with the influenza. As far as we know right now, this is not what we call an airborne virus, which means it doesn't hang around in the air after someone coughs or sneezes, um, allowing for a prolonged course of, of, uh, of exposure. So right now we think it is something that you would come in contact with by being in close contact with somebody who's actively infected or touching a surface that they got um, secretions on. Um, so far what we know is it presents like other influenza infections. Uh, people usually have fever, headache, and myalgias, muscle aches. And that's followed by cough, runny nose, and sometimes sore throat. Some of the cases in Mexico were associated with diarrhea, but so far I think the cases in the United States have been primarily fever, headache, muscle aches, and an upper respiratory-like syndrome. So if someone had allergies, they'd be more likely to just have a runny nose or a sore throat or a cough, but no fever. So I think in this situation, fever, headache, and muscle pain would be the distinguishing features between normal allergies and influenza symptoms. If someone is concerned that their symptoms might indicate H1N1, the first thing they should do is use common sense. At this time, there are no known cases in the Washington area. So unless they've been recently in New York City or in Mexico or exposed to somebody who's known to have the disease, it's very unlikely that what they have is really H1N1. On the other hand, if they're very sick, they're, they're, they feel short of breath, they can't get enough oxygen in, they have terrible vomiting, um, they have a severe headache, anything that would normally take them in to see to an emergency room or to see their physician, they should clearly do that. But in most cases, this is not going to be H1N1. Um, and I would say if, if they are planning to visit their doctor, they should call ahead and just let them know that they're concerned about this because some offices are taking extra precautions like masking someone coming into the office with these symptoms and they may want to give them a special room to wait in. If they're going to the emergency room because they're that ill, they should notify the people in the beginning that they are concerned about these symptoms and again they'll do precautions. The primary way to avoid getting H1N1 or any influenza is good hand washing. And that is actually more difficult than we think. It means if you're going to use soap and water, it's 10 to 20 seconds of washing. Um, they sometimes say to sing two verses of uh, the birthday song in order to count out 20 seconds. But it's a, a long time of washing. That works well. The other thing you can use are these waterless hand um, preparations like Perel. And again, with those, you want to rub the, all the surfaces of your hand and let, let it air dry, because it's actually the alcohol drying that kills the virus. Uh, so good hand washing, and again, always good hand washing before you eat, or if you've been out in a crowd or at Levy or at one of the restaurants, before you actually start consuming your handheld food, use one of these products or make sure your hands have been clean. Um, the flu shot that was given back in October, unfortunately, doesn't have any protection against H1N1 because this is a brand new strain of flu. They are now in development of looking at whether it will be useful to try to develop a vaccine against this for next fall, but we won't have anything until probably the early fall. There are medications that are effective against this virus. So far, two medications, one called Tamiflu and another called Zanamivir 
or Relenza are available. They're prescription drugs. They have to be given um, by prescription by a physician. And the course is about a five-day course, and they do appear to be effective against this, this uh, H1N1 virus. The problem is that to be effective, they have to be taken usually within about 48 hours of symptoms. But obviously, if somebody's very ill and hospitalized, we would use it even later. None of these drugs are curative like, say, an antibiotic but they do decrease the severity of the illness and shorten the, the time period when people are shedding the virus. I should say they can also be used in some cases, particularly for people at high risk, for prevention. In other words, if you were the household contact of somebody who has known H1N1 and you were under the age of five or over the age of 65 or you had a pre-existing lung or heart condition, then the use of this as, quote, prophylaxis could help prevent you from getting a severe infection with H1N1. As of today, Thursday, um, there have been no, no deaths from people who've acquired H1N1 in the United States. All of the cases here have been mild. Some have required hospitalization, but none have, have resulted in death. The one death that's been reported, um, uh, I think uh, the child was four years old in Houston, Texas. He actually had been brought by his parents from Mexico, so he acquired the illness in Mexico. In Mexico, we really don't know the extent. There have been a number of reports of deaths. Um, they have not been confirmed as being caused by H1N1, but it does appear that it has been a more severe illness there. And I can tell you at this point, no one understands why that is. But again, for the United States so far, this has been a, a fairly mild to moderate infection, and there have been no deaths. We'll have to just wait and see what develops. We're only about a week into this, and we'll just need to watch over time, um, both now and probably in the fall, to see if, if this uh, virus is going to become more virulent over time or less virulent over time. I know there's been a lot of concern about like eating or preparing pork as a source for getting H1N1, but you can't get it that way. Um, this really is something that may have started in pigs but is now has nothing to do with pigs or swine. This is not a foodborne illness at all. In fact, we were calling it swine flu, and the reason we've changed to the name influenza A H1N1 is because it really has no association now with pork or pork products. So other than, again, careful hand washing, um, you don't have to worry about that.